Well, hi, everyone. I'm super excited to be here virtually. My name is Natalie Sturm. I'm a graduate research assistant at Dakota Lakes Research Farm with Dwayne Beck. Um, I actually defended my thesis um, about a week ago, and so I'm just wrapping up um, my program, but I'm really excited to kind of give you all um, just a quick overview. Um, oops, excuse, sorry about that. Uh, a quick overview of the work I've been doing at Dakota Lakes Research Farm, specifically um, related to crop rotations. So where does the soil story start at Dakota Lakes? Um, well, as I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, started with research on reducing runoff in irrigated systems. Um, and of course, the answer ultimately ended up being um, no-till was really the key um, to just helping to solve that runoff issue. I just want to play a couple quick clips. These are some rainfall simulation tests that we ran this past year, and that's just a windshield wiper motor situated on the ladder. Um, and we were able to apply about four inches of water um, in about 10 minutes. And we would get, um, most fields actually had no runoff. Um, so Dakota Lakes has definitely been very successful in solving that first um, soil issue. So yeah, just to, as I mentioned, you know, we started with the irrigation research. Now we can put on four inches in 10 minutes with very little runoff. Um, a four inch rainstorm, you know, over a course of 10 minutes would be a catastrophic event. So with no-till, we've been able to kind of be resilient to, to an extreme weather event like that. So where are we now? The big thing um, is that we've been observing pretty significant differences in soil quality among the crop rotations at the farm. So these four images um, I all took this past summer. Um, They're all from Dakota Lakes. So they've all been under the same continuous low disturbance um, no-till management uh, for 30 years. You can see the top two images, I'm sure we would all agree, those soils don't look as nice as the bottom two images. So we would say that the top two images kind of have a, a poor soil quality. You notice that that platiness um, or sort of those flakes of, of soil that um, indicates to us that that soil is more susceptible to erosion, um, issues with infiltration, um, and air and root movement can occur in those top two um, images there. On the bottom two images, I think most people would agree that those look like really healthy, good quality soils. You know, they've got that really crumbly sort of chocolate cake um, type look associated with good soil structure and lots of organic matter. So the only difference between all of these soils is the crop rotations that they've been under for the past 30 years. So as no-till of course becomes really widely promoted, it's important to understand how crop rotations impact both soil quality and crop yields under no-till management specifically. So that's kind of the, where the objective of my research has come in, is to actually specifically measure the various soil properties um, to define differences that up until now have only been visually observed. So I've done some deep soil sampling um, with the getting soil probe there on the left picture, and then some more surface um, soil sampling shown in the right hand side. So of course, soil quality can be broken up um, into three groups of properties, biological, chemical, and physical properties. So just to give a brief overview of some of the properties I measured, um, I did a, uh, well, I, we had Ward Laboratories in, in Nebraska um, run the phospholipid fatty acid analysis, or PLFA, which gives us a pretty good overview of the microbial community, as well as information about fungal biomass, for example. Um, we had Ward Labs uh, run a bunch of chemical property analysis, you know, pH, organic matter, and organic carbon, NPK, um, base cations. And then for physical properties, I was looking at aggregate size. So that kind of gets at that granular versus platy structure. And I used the dry rotary sieving method, um, where basically I have a mechanical shaker. It separates out um, soil into different size um, aggregates. And then I can um, basically create one number that gives an index of the soil structure for that sample. 
Okay, so to give a quick overview of the rotations that we've got at Dakota Lakes, um, we'll start with the irrigated ones. So I have the name of the rotation at the top, the, the images of what the actual sequence is, and then some descriptors below. So we'll start with the corn soy um, rotation. The diversity value, that comes from Dwayne Beck's um, Crop Rotation Diversity Index, which basically takes into account um, the different crop types, the intervals between the different crop types, um, and conflicts with operations like seeding and harvest. So a negative number means really low diversity or a pretty poorly designed rotation, and then the higher the number is, um, the more diverse or, or the more um, kind of desired the rotation is. Of course, corn soy only has, you know, the two crop types, and then um, we can consider this what we call 50% high residue system. So crops like corn, wheat, sorghum, oats, all the grassy crops, we consider high residue because they leave a lot of biomass on the field after we take the grain off. Um, broadleaf crops like soybeans, peas, canola, sunflowers, would, we would consider to be lower residue since it doesn't leave as much biomass um, after harvest and that biomass um, decomposes or, or degrades really quickly. So 50% high residue in the corn soy, one out of the two crops is a high residue crop. The next irrigated rotation is a corn, corn, soy, wheat, soy rotation. It gets a diversity index of 1.9, um, has three different crop types, so warm and cool season grasses, and then a warm season broadleaf. And since three out of the five crops in the rotation are high residue crops, we can consider that 60% high residue. Corn, corn, soy, wheat um, just takes out that extra soybean. Um, so its diversity is a little bit lower, um, but the residue is a little bit higher. So three out of the uh, four crops are high residue. And finally, continuous corn, monoculture, um, no diversity essentially, but that would be considered our 100% high residue rotation. So we have a really nice sort of gradient of different pro uh, proportions of high residue crops as well as different diversities. And the same is true in our dry land system. So just to go over um, the dry land rotations really quick. First, we have a wheat broadleaf, corn broadleaf. Um, in the dry land, we've used a lot of different types of broadleaf crops. Um, you know, peas, canola, soybeans, sunflower, um, lots of different things. So I just use broadleaf because there's been a lot over time. The diversity index of this first rotation is uh, 1.5. It has all four crop types included. And since two out of the four crops in the rotation are high residue, we can consider this a 50% high residue rotation. Next is a wheat corn broadleaf, um, which has a slightly higher diversity, um, only three crop types. And since two out of the three crops are high residue, we call it 67% high residue. Wheat, wheat, sorghum, corn broadleaf um, is our 80% high residue or four out of five high residue crops. And then just so, to note over here, we are kind of looking into the, the next big step for Dakota Lakes is really integrating um, perennial sequences into the annual cropping systems. And so this past year was the first year of a winter wheat after five years of switchgrass. And so we can make some comparisons between um, the winter wheat after switchgrass versus all of the other rotations which haven't had a perennial sequence. This field that had the five years of switchgrass and then went into winter wheat used to belong to this first 50% high residue rotation. So we can certainly make some comparisons there. Okay, just to go over um, some uh, results really quickly, I'll talk about, oh, sorry, um, biological, chemical, and physical results. So first looking at fungal biomass, um, specifically our muscular mycorrhizal fungi. So this is that symbiotic fungi um, associates with plant roots and really helps with water uptake and nutrient uptake, particularly phosphorus. So this is definitely a really important microbial group. Um, I wanna take a few seconds to kind of orient you um, to the graphs. So on the X axis, we have the rotations and we have them in increasing order um, of high residue. So going from 50 to 100, 
Oh, I don't know what's happening with that laser pointer there. Sorry about that. Um, and then we have um, the fungal biomass is on the y-axis. Each diamond um, indicates the, the mean fungal biomass. And then the different colors just indicate the different um, crop phases. And I found that the higher residue rotations have a slightly higher arbuscular mycorrhizal fungal biomass um, in the irrigated systems. The dryland values tend to be lower just simply due to less crop biomass inputs over time. Okay, looking at gram positive to gram negative bacteria ratio. So gram positive and gram negative are just two types um, of bacteria. When you take the ratio of them, that basically serves as an index of stress in the microbial community. Um, so a higher gram positive to gram negative ratio indicates that the microbial community is experiencing some kind of stress, um, particularly drought stress, actually. And what we found was that the 50% high residue rotations have a higher gram positive to gram negative ratio, meaning that those microbial communities are more stressed compared to all of the other rotations. Okay, moving on to chemical properties, starting with pH and calcium. Again, we have rotation um, on the x-axis going in increasing order. Um, of high residue, starting with the, the dry land and then the irrigated. pH is on the y-axis. And then again, the diamonds indicate um, the mean. Light gray is the zero to two inch sample. And the dark gray is the two to six inch sample. What I found was that the continuous corn and the dryland alternate year broadleaf had the lowest pH, um, but it's not really acidic enough to cause problems. Um, we're still above six, so not, not too concerned there. But P, or pH or, or acidic soils are really becoming um, a pretty critical issue in a lot of growing regions. So one way we think we can deal with that is by adding a perennial sequence. So the perennial would help to increase pH levels in a couple different ways. The first would be we wouldn't be using as much synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, <clears throat> and we know that nitrogen fertilizer tends to have an acidifying effect. So by really lessening or even totally eliminating the use of N fertilizer during the perennial phase, that helps. And secondly, we believe, um, and I'll show in the next slide, that the really deep roots of the perennial, which can go down, you know, six, seven, eight, ten feet deep, can actually bring up base cations like calcium from low in the soil profile and bring it up to the top, um, which can help to increase pH as well. So this graph is from deep sampling in the dryland systems. Um, and so I've just circled the wheat broadleaf, corn broadleaf rotation, and then that five-year switchgrass, which um, used to belong to this wheat broadleaf, corn broadleaf rotation. And just after five years, we actually have um, slightly statistically significantly increase the pH. Again, at Dakota Lakes, we don't really worry too much about our acidity because um, we don't have acidic soils, but this same principle can be applied um, to other regions. Yeah, so we slightly increase pH by adding a perennial sequence. Okay, this graph is the calcium graph. And again, this is for the dry land um, deep sampling. And we found that the, indeed the perennial roots are bringing up calcium from below. So in both the five-year switchgrass and we have just the long-term establishment of switchgrass just as kind of a reference. Okay, soil organic matter. So this is from the surface sampling. So the light gray is a zero to two inch sample and the dark gray is the two to six inch sample. And we can kind of see this trend as we increase the proportion of high residue crops in the rotation, the soil organic matter content also increases. This makes sense. Um, if we add more biomass into the system, we would expect that the organic matter levels would also increase. 
Um, it is interesting to note um, that five years of perennial didn't really impact um, soil organic matter levels. So either the five years wasn't enough time to, to really make a difference or the organic matter levels um, were pretty high to begin with. And so it's more difficult to see statistical differences. Again, this is the, the dry land um, deep sampling. So these are just the dry land rotations, the deep sampling, but we still see this trend of increasing organic matter as we increase the proportion of high residue crops. Soil organic carbon, of course, we'd expect to probably follow a pretty similar trend to the organic matter since organic matter is about 50 to 60% um, carbon. And we do see that same trend as where as we increase the proportion of high residue crops in the rotation, um, the, the soil organic carbon content also increases. Same trend in the deep sampling uh, for the dry land as well. Okay, aggregate size. This is that physical property to kind of get at the soil structure. So a larger aggregate size, um, so higher up on the y-axis um, is indicative of, of better soil structure, um, better water infiltration and less susceptibility to erosion. So these are from both the irrigated and dry land surface sampling. And we see almost exactly the same trend as we observed in the organic matter and the organic carbon where as we increase the proportion of high residue producing crops in the rotation, we increase the aggregate size. And so that's making that chocolate cake crumbly structure. Okay, so to summarize all of these results, um, I basically made a very simple sort of scorecard, I call it, um, to kind of find the total basic soil quality score to compare the rotations. So the way I came up with this is I just looked at, you know, a few select um, soil quality properties. So for example, fungal biomass. And then I looked at the corn soy rotation and in my statistical analysis, I looked at how many times was, did corn soy rotation have a significantly greater fungal biomass than the other irrigated rotations? And there were zero instances of that. So it gets a zero. For corn, corn, soy, wheat, soy, there were two instances where its fungal biomass was greater than the other systems. So it gets a two and so on. So I do that for each property, add them all up, and we get this total score. So a higher number means that there were more instances in which that system had a um, significantly improved soil quality property. And I found that rotations with 60% or greater proportion of high residue crops beat out or outperform the lower residue, really common corn soy rotation. Same thing for the dry land, tallied up um, the scores. And we see that the 67% and 80% high residue rotations beat out that 50% rotation or that alternate year broadleaf rotation. So it's not enough just to think about soil quality. Of course, soil health, soil quality is really important, but if those don't go along with either a maintenance or an increase in crop yields, um, it's a little bit more difficult to say that we should be doing these techniques to improve soil quality if um, farmer profitability doesn't go along with that. So I just wanna give you um, a brief overview of some general yield data from the farm. So just as a reminder, these are irrigated rotations. So we have the four different rotations. And I looked at um, irrigated corn yields over about a 20 year period and found that the first year corn in the corn, corn, soy, wheat, soy rotation had a significantly greater um, corn yield than all of the other rotations. And so the specific yields are in this table here. The little letters just mean that each of those rotations yields are significantly different from each other. So the first year corn certainly outcompetes the corn, soy um, and the continuous corn as well. To put it another way, three quarters of the time, the first year corn of the corn, corn, soy, wheat, soy is the highest yielding corn. Those are pretty good odds. <laughs> um, and as you know, we recall back to that soil quality summary, 
the corn, corn, soy, wheat, soy rotation um, did kind of beat out the, the corn, soy rotation in terms of soil quality. Okay, for these, these are the, the dry land rotations again. And I looked at dry land winter wheat yields over about a 15 year period, since the winter wheat um, is a really important crop in, in dry land systems typically. And found that the wheat corn broadleaf and the first year wheat of the wheat wheat sorghum corn broadleaf um, had slightly higher yields um, than the other, than that wheat broadleaf corn broadleaf um, rotation. To put it another way, I found that two thirds of the time, the wheat corn broadleaf um, was the highest yielding winter wheat. Again, those are pretty good odds. And thinking back to the so quality summary for the dry land rotations, um, the wheat corn broadleaf was kind of in the middle there with, with its soil quality. So had a better soil quality than the wheat broadleaf corn broadleaf and was able to also maintain those higher yields as well. To put it, all these, these yield data within a context um, of an actual, um, you know, hypothetical 5,000 acre farm, um, we can just look at some of these differences in yields. So I just took the area per crop phase for each given rotation and multiplied it by the average um, crop yield of the specific crop. And we see it in corn soy, um, we have a slightly higher um, corn yield, um, but the soybean yield is, is pretty much exactly the same between um, corn soy and corn, corn, soy, wheat, soy. And in addition, we get the winter wheat yield as well from that more diverse rotation. And in addition to having, you know, kind of a more diverse um, yield, more diverse markets, the corn, corn, soy, wheat, soy rotation definitely has significantly improved soil quality over the corn soy rotation. So we can improve soils while also um, maintaining or even increasing crop yields. This is just a hypothetical yields for 5,000 acre dry land farm. There's kind of a lot going on um, on this table, but just wanted to show that um, this wheat corn broadleaf and the wheat wheat sorghum corn broadleaf would both be good um, options for rotations mm -hmm. because they both improve soil quality over that alternate year broadleaf and they have much higher um, overall crop yields as well. So kind of to wrap up, I like to say it's not just no-till um, to improve soil quality and increase crop yields within no-till. We have to implement rotations which balance high residue crops with the rotational diversity. So, you know, we can have a, you know, a corn monoculture that's, you know, 100% high residue, um, creates great chocolate cake soils, but doesn't have the diversity to um, have the yields that we need to maintain profitability. So by balancing um, the high residue with the diversity, we can improve um, soil quality and crop yields. Um, just a couple quick notes. Um, crop rotations change soils over time, of course. So there's definitely a need um, for long-term studies like those um, that are done at Dakota Lakes. These are differences that have become evident over 30 years. Um, and I definitely think we need to really promote and push for really long-term research because that's the kind of research that's necessary for these results. Um, another need is to try to make some changes to crop insurance and farm bill policy to reduce barriers to crop rotation adoption. So, you know, certain crops are included in crop insurance, can be a little harder to convince folks to implement those into the rotation, for example. So I'm going to end it there. Um, thank you all for your attention. And I'd welcome any questions or comments. And if you want to reach me, um, my email is down there at the bottom. I also highly encourage you all, if you haven't already, to check out um, the oh, sorry the virtual field day that Dakota Lakes did in 2020. If you just go to YouTube and search Dakota Lakes Research Farm uh, Field Day, there's some really awesome videos showing these differences. And so, yeah, I'd love to take any questions at this time. You know, Natalie, this is Dan Forgy. You probably thought I was haunting you or tracking you or whatever because 
uh, what I was doing was I was trying to get the information that you had. I didn't realize talking to Cheryl Reese, I didn't realize you were not in South Dakota. I thought you were still in South Dakota. But anyway, yeah. I really, this is this is what we need. Just like you just said, research like this. You can take this to where we're trying to get people to put cereals in their rotations in the eastern part of the state. This is exactly what we need. And uh, the more we can share what you have done, the better off we are. And, and I really, I really um, uh, thank you for doing this work and, and because it, it's, uh, you know, there's not, I, I very seldom, I've been with the, uh, around Dakota Lakes for 30 years and uh, was on the board for six. And, and I just, <clears throat> I've never seen data like this out of Dakota Lakes. <laughs> So, I mean, I really appreciate what you've done. You've done us a great service, Natalie, and I'm serious about that. Well, th well thank you so much. And, and I would love to share with anybody, whether that's me presenting or I can share data in these slides as well. I'd, I'd love to do my part. Yeah. Thanks, Natalie. Anybody else have some questions for Natalie? Natalie Maybe if you want to stop sharing. Okay. Can you hear? And see if they have anybody else. Just, yeah. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Oh, this is Jason Miller. Yep. Uh, and I echo Danny's uh, previous comments 100%. question I had was on your organic matter those trends, and I agree with the trends 110%. I was just wondering when your benchmark was and what your estimation of percent increase per year or fraction of a percent of an increase per year on yeah, organic yeah. matter or organic carbon either. Either yeah, so um, there were some initial soil sampling done in the early 90s when Dakota Lake started. No carbon data, unfortunately, um, but in terms of organic matter, we've basically seen that we've been able to increase organic matter about one to two percent over 30 years. Um, so definitely not, you know, the, the five percent or 10 percent increase that we that we sometimes <coughs> about um but we have gotten to the point where we pretty easily have four percent um organic matter so it has increased um it's just not astronomical yeah so yeah, when so you when you take that total divided by 30 then then it's i mean it's a fraction of a percent is basically what it, yeah. what it is yeah yep. 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 Right. thanks yep. Yeah. And I can get you that long term data if you'd like. It's there's not a ton of it since there were only a few samples taken in the early 90s. Um, but I do have those actual numbers if you want them. Yep. And I yeah, I have some of that from Dwayne, yeah. but he yeah, share all the fields. I have it for a specific rotation on one or two fields. And yep. really what needs to be done is a summary of a certain crop rotation and that, that that data analyzed over those fields that are contained in each of those crop rotations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it is difficult because we don't have data for every field from the beginning. Um, makes it a little harder. But... Yep. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Good job. Thank you. Anybody <laughs> else? Yeah. Um, yeah, this is David Kruger and I'm, I live in the northeast corner of the state. Um, a couple of the questions or one of the things that hits me what you were talking about, I agree with Danny's comments, it's very good information. But to go to the next step to sell it to farmers, I'm curious if you've done any research on the, I mean, you showed the, the different yield levels for the different rotations, but have you ever looked at the profitability for those rotations in the long-term rotations compared to the short? Because even though there's a little yes, less yield, I think there's more profitability in them and to sell that to other farmers to introduce more wheat and other crops in the rotation we have to show they just see the yield and they say well it yields less i'm not going to do it mm -hmm. they have to see a picture of the of the dollars more that we're making per acre yeah, yeah. So I haven't done specific profitability work. Um, that's kind of the next steps. We would, it'd be really great to have maybe another grad student or somebody actually, you know, run some some profitability numbers. I can tell you what Dwayne has told me and kind of just our um, kind of observations is that in the longer rotations, 
our inputs really decrease. So we don't have to spend as much money on herbicides, for example, because our weeds are just so much better managed having those longer rotations. Um, and, and you can't, you can't really combat the weeds without, without the winter cereal. I mean, that just really helps kind of knock out those weeds because it's a totally different life cycle than the weeds are, are typically used to in a corn soy rotation. The other thing is that I know um, in that first year corn of the corn, corn, soy, wheat, soy, we don't need like the way Dwayne described it to me was like, we don't need as fancy um, genetics packages because it's been so long since there was a corn um, that we can actually save a little bit money um, on that first corn variety. Yeah, I, I agree with you. That's what I, that's what I've been I just been been in a three crop or four crop rotation, mm -hmm. but I agree with you. Weed control is just not an issue. Yeah, I'll save fifteen to twenty dollars an acre on weed control. Fertilizer is what I've been playing with the last five years of reducing fertilizer, and I think we can reduce our fertilizer way more than people yeah. believe. Right? Mm -hmm. And I've been playing with that for the last five years, and uh, I've been mm -hmm. cutting it down. And a year like this year, people say what I'm putting on for fertilizer, and I'm saving. 60, 70 bucks an acre at high wow. it's like, whoa. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean that that starts to that starts to open some eyes. Totally. Yeah. And some other work that we've done at Dakota Lakes, and maybe you've heard some talks on it as well, is drawing down our soil test P levels in the irrigated systems. Um, so we've drawn them down to essentially almost nothing, and we don't have any yield differences. Um because of that, basically. Um, and we, we believe that's because of that arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi association. Um, the plants then rely on the fungi to go out and find phosphorus, and, and they do, even though the soil test P is low. So there's definitely room to kind of try to play with the, the fertility as well. So are you doing that on the corn bean rotation along with the longer term ones or just... Just the long, just the, we've drawn down our soil P levels on all of the irrigated fields just um, out of environmental concern since we're right next to the Missouri. Um, but the studies have been done primarily on that long rotation. Okay. Um, yeah. That's one I've been hesitant to draw down is the P levels because yeah. we work so hard to get them up there. Now. I know. <laughs> yeah. but, I know. Uh, I know. It's hard to, no, I know. It's hard to go back and say, I'm going to, cut back on my pee when we work yeah. so hard to get it there. And that would be data I'd love to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. So I can, yeah, Dwayne has that. Um, another grad student, Brennan Lewis, is the one that's been working on that project. Um, and so I can try, maybe I can send Cindy some information or, or just have Dwayne contact her and he can yeah. send that information. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks, Natalie. I got one more question. If okay. I can take a little more time. Absolutely. <laughs> Your rain infiltration intrigued me uh, <laughs> where I live. I'm one of the few people that no tills. I live on the edge of the Coteau Hills. From my place west, there's about 10 miles of grassland. Mm -hmm. And my fields are basically the first fields of farm ground. And we live in a strange, maybe it's strange, but I hear the, I hear the rainfall immense. These people talk and we get that amount in two days. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I'm serious. I mean, we get, and, and so if you, if you drive around and you watch, we'll have a three to four inch rain and it'll come in an hour, just yeah. don't. And if you drive around in my long-term no-till no fields, we'll have hardly any water running off and the neighbor's fields will be water right. running. Mm -hmm. And, and then the next day we have, I call it the comma cloud, the clouds come and then they wrap around and they back in and they give us another four inches. And our grasslands will not even begin to take it. So the water comes off our grasslands because it's got a lot of slope, goes across the roads, and our farm ground can't take it either. But the grassland isn't taking it. Hmm. What we've got is we've got two feet of, of topsoil and, and kind of a sand with a hard clay underneath it. And we aren't getting roots into that hard clay. So we can infiltrate the top two foot put a sand. I talked to Dwayne probably 25, 30 years ago with an agronomist from my area, and he was telling us our top two feet of soil will hold about four inches of water mm. because it's a, a sandy soil. You know, you know, we've got areas that hold 10 inches too, but right where I'm at, there's a lot of sand. 
but we're not infiltrating into the lower, into the deeper stuff. And we get so much erosion in the last 10 years from those big grains. And somehow we have to be able to infiltrate that next level of ground to slow that down. Yeah. But so we're not getting it in our pasture ground. That water's coming off our pasture grounds and taking the pasture ground to be mismanaged. Yeah. And how are what should they be? And you gotta add soil on the top. I would be my so I don't know if biomass back down on the ground and start to build it up. So if you've only got two foot, now you want 30 inches. And if you've got 30 inches, you want 36. Mm -hmm. I would be then you're storing more water there where you can. And then I think the other part is that's the way it's designed. So then it hits that the hard clay and it's supposed to go somewhere else. So you fill up your stuff. It uh, uh we just have we just have terrible erosion and especially in the spring we get because we'll get the rains in early in the spring and then late in the fall and then the summer's dry. Mm -hmm. I mean like so, our township, I'm in the township in the township, but what 29 places historically the water goes across the road two to three times a year that wipes out 29, 29 wood spots, you know, just but but we'll have 10 inches of rain in, in two days. The first four or five will take the next four or five is just Gully washers because the ground's full. And then the computer. Reason, <laughs> the reason Thailand has become a thing is because we can't cycle water. Mm -hmm. yeah. Never so done. Four feet and a half. Go ahead, Natalie. Oh, I was, yeah. So, so it is interesting that your your pastures or the the grassland next to it. I'd be curious what like what species and are they cool or, or warm season? Um, what what's yeah. that? They're, they're both. They're both, yeah. So in terms of your cropland, I mean, the, the thing to try would be to see if you can get a perennial establishment to make those root channels go down as far as they can. Um, Cause those, you know, those root channels will stay for a little bit um, afterwards. Other than that, yeah, it's, that's a tricky situation. Did you see the comments, Natalie? There's one about yeah. where you intend to publish any of your work. Yeah, so I'm still kind of working on where exactly um, to publish it. I, um, I'm i gonna try to publish some of my work in a scientific journal, but I also would really like to maybe try to do um, some kind of, um, you know, maybe a, a, a handout or, or a, a farmer publication. Um, not sure um, where exactly. So if anyone has um, any suggestions, I'd definitely be happy to take them. And then how was the switchgrass managed? Okay, so switchgrass was planted in 2015. Mostly um, we cut, I believe they cut a lot of it for seed. Um, they actually just harvested it for seed. That was um, primarily, and I know it was grazed for at least one season. Um, half of it was grazed by our cattle. In terms of that, um, not a whole lot of management went into it. We did plant some peas um, in there a little bit just to kind of fill in some of the gaps and give the cattle a little bit more to chew on. Um, but as far as I know, there wasn't a whole lot of management um, involved once it once it was established. Getting it established is kind of the trick, but once it's there, pretty good to go. Thanks, Stanley. Um, Stan Wise is on, and he works with the coalition. Um, he's our communications person, so we can definitely help with getting the information out. Yeah. And yeah. maybe I'll contact you um, after today sometime, and we can talk about you know if you want assistance in a one page. Um, information, we can assist with that type of yeah. information getting out too. So we can talk with Dwayne and see if that's something that would be all right. Totally. Yeah. And I would definitely want to make sure Dwayne's okay yep. with it too, since this Absolutely. is all his work that I'm just yep. quantifying. <laughs> so Absolutely. Thank you for doing that. It's great yep. to see that information get out because those are the, that's the way we're going to have um, assistance and helping people understand what Dwayne has been able to do on Dakota Lakes is yeah. to be able to have that information and have those numbers and get it into some agronomist hands because yeah. then we'll have them helping the producers make some different um, opportunities. Yep. Yeah, totally. So yeah, I'm, yeah, I was happy to present and thank you all thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah.